Hello, and welcome to another message from the Venice Church of Christ, where disciples making disciples in Los Angeles. I'm Ethan, and I'm glad that you have given us the gift of spending some time with us as we explore more of the truths that we can learn from the Word of God, as we seek to apply them to be more faithful Christians in the Lord's kingdom in the future than we've been in the past. We hope that you're doing well in the midst of the, the present uh, issues and, and challenges, and we are uh, always interested in, in your feedback about the things that we're saying, and if there's any way we can be of service to you, if we can be of some encouragement, if you have questions or comments, we'd love to hear about them. And again, we're so glad that you're spending some time with us today. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father, hallowed be your name. We're so thankful that you've given us all the blessings of life for you and your son, for the Spirit, for the Word, for one another, for uh, this, all the spiritual blessings you've given us in Christ and of this material creation. At this time, Father, we're especially mindful of all those who are suffering through the COVID-19 pandemic. We pray that you would heal all who are ill, that you would protect, strengthen, and sustain the medical workers, the doctors, nurses, and others who are working with them. We pray for all those who now are unemployed, that you may help um, them strengthen, sustain them, and provide provision for them. Uh, we're also mindful of all the essential workers who are working, that you would protect them and strengthen, sustain them, and provide wisdom and insight uh, to all of the leaders, that they may know the best way forward uh, to preserve life at this time. As we're about to open uh, your word, Father, we pray that you would open our hearts and minds to come to better understanding of the things you made known in Jesus, that we may learn from them and apply them to our lives and faith and to be more effective workers in your kingdom. We pray these things in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Today let us explore what the Lord has said in Matthew 25, beginning in verse 1. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five of them were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose, and they trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you neither know the day nor the hour. Thus Jesus has proclaimed the parable of the ten virgins. He does so while he is in Jerusalem during the final week of his life. In Matthew 21 through 23, we see how he interacted in the temple, teaching and, and refuting and challenging the religious authorities. In Matthew 24 and verse 1, we're told that the disciples were showing him all the buildings of the temple complex. And Jesus told them that all of those buildings would be torn down and not one stone would last upon any other. And so then Jesus went to the Mount of Olives and his disciples met him there and asked him three very important questions. When will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And so the rest of Matthew 24 and 25, including the parable we've just read, are all part of what's commonly called the Olivet Discourse, where Jesus goes and starts explaining the answers to these questions. In the first uh, 36 verses of Matthew 24, he really emphasizes what's going to happen uh, as um, the day comes uh, for the end of Jerusalem. And then beginning in verse 36, after establishing the heaven and earth would pass away, but his words would not pass away, he begins talking about the various signs uh, that would indicate his coming both then and at the final, final end of the age. That no one knows, only the Father, that it would be like the days of Noah, where people were marrying and giving in marriage, everything was normal, and then the rain started falling. That one would be taken and another would be left. That they need to stay awake, they do not know when their Lord is coming. But if the master of the house had known when uh, the thief would enter, he would have been ready for him. They must also be ready because the Son of Man would come at an hour they were not expecting. 
And so he asks, who the faithful and wise servant is, whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master finds doing so when he comes. Truly, he says, uh, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that wicked servant says to himself, my master is delayed and begins to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect and at an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites. And there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth in that place. It's very important, verses 45 and 51 there, because Matthew 25, 1 begins with then. Uh, there's no chapter division in the original. This is all part of the same discussion. And so the then shows that the parable of the ten virgins builds off of what Jesus just said about the uh, faithful servant and the wicked servant. And he says it's the kingdom of heaven will be like. He begins so many parables that way in Matthew 13, for instance, that the parables teach us about life in the kingdom. And so everything that we're going to see in this parable explains life in the kingdom, uh, the reign of God. The kingdom of God is how Luke and Mark will talk about it. Matthew, it's heaven, heaven as the domain of God. And it's the reign of God. A king rules over something. That over which a king reigns is his kingdom. And so how does the reign of God uh, be manifest in Christ is often described in parables. And this parable is uh, absolutely part of that. And so we're told that we've got uh, the situation. We've got um, virgins. We have a bridegroom. We have a wedding feast. Um, this tells us that Jesus is using the language and the premise of weddings and the festivities that go along with weddings and the rituals. And the challenges that we have is that we don't have a lot of great background information to really explain what's going on here. We can have full confidence that Jesus' audience did. All of those who are listening to Jesus would have been very familiar with the wedding rituals. Uh, Jesus himself went to one in John chapter 2. They all would have gone to many weddings themselves. Uh, participation in weddings was just a religious obligation. Uh, seven days of feasting. Really hard, right? And so they would all know. From what we can tell from all the various kinds of sources we have out there, uh, some of them are from the Greeks and Romans, some of them are from uh, the, the Jewish uh, rabbis in the Talmud and, and other sources like that, uh, we can see uh, that the, there would be first a betrothal, and there would be a great festivity with betrothal, but a betrothal wasn't the wedding. Uh, betrothals could last for some time. Uh, Matthew and tells us that uh, Mary and Joseph were betrothed uh, for at least some time there at the beginning in Matthew chapter 1. The bride would remain in the father's house until the time of the wedding. And on the wedding day, the bride would be dressed up and would be taken to the bridegroom's house or that of his parents about nightfall. And there would be a procession uh, where you would have all of these uh, attendants of the bride with torches and lamps that would... Uh, uh, proceed with the bride. The bridegroom would then come out and receive her to himself, and that would lead to this great seven-day feast. In other evidence, the bridegroom himself has an entourage as well. And Greco-Roman sources look at having a feast beforehand, where the bridegroom actually has gone into the bride's house and feasts there, and then takes the bride out of that house to his house or his parents' house, and has a feast there. And maybe that's also what's going on here behind this parable. And so we have ten virgins, and they're waiting for the bridegroom that they can enter this marriage feast. And the big question is, of course, where are they waiting? Are they waiting in front of the a bridegroom's house? If they are, that means they're part of the bridegroom's clan, uh, his family in Israel. And they're waiting for the end of that feast at the bridal house. And then they will enter into the grand feast with the bridegroom as part of his entourage. If they're the bride's house, they're the virgins are the friends of the bride, and they're waiting for the bridegroom to come, and they will go to escort him in to receive the bride to begin the feast at the bridal house. And how we understand this is kind of associated with how we understand who all these people are anyway. Uh, most likely, bridegroom is God in Christ, who uh, in his return. The virgins are participants in the kingdom as part of his clan or just as associated with the bride. And the marriage feast would be the eschatological celebration. And all of this would be based upon the imagery that we see in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 15, where Jesus has earlier used the illustration of him as the bridegroom, uh, and also in Revelation 19, 7 and 9, where everybody is invited to come to uh, the feast 
uh, uh, the marriage supper of the Lamb. And it really comes out of Isaiah 61.10 and 62.5 where we see the great joy uh, of, of serving of the Lord as a bridegroom uh, decks himself with his uh, garland, the bride adorns herself with her jewelry. Uh, one challenge is, is that in Ephesians 5 and even Revelation, uh, the bride is the church and the church is the bride. And there's no bride in this text. Uh, we don't hear about the bride at all, which seems kind of strange, but uh, we need to remember that metaphors don't have to be consistent. And so we have different dimensions or different parts of the story being told. And if we try to put them all together, it may look contradictory, but again, it's metaphors. Uh, each is trying to teach us its own lesson. And Jesus here is not focusing on the bride because that's not his interest in this parable. His interest in the parable here are the virgins and their level of preparedness. And that's why, even though you could see them as associates of the bride, it's probably better to see them as uh, the virgins who are part of the bridegroom's entourage, waiting in front of the bridegroom's house, part of his clan, waiting for him to return to enter into this ultimate eschatological banquet. And as we can see, as we look in the story itself, what happens? You've got these ten virgins. And the only difference among them is that five are wise and five are foolish. And in this sense, the folly or foolish, the folly or the wisdom here is the wise have brought extra oil, the foolish have not. And they all fall asleep waiting for the bridegroom. He's delayed. And then finally at midnight, the cry goes out. The bridegroom is coming. And so they all rise and they trim their lamps. And then the foolish realize they're running out of oil. And they ask for more oil. And there's, the, the wives don't have enough to give them. And so they go to the market to buy oil. They come back. And by the time they come back, the bridegroom's already come and brought in the wise virgins. The door is shut. They knock on the door to open up, and they're not allowed in. I do not even know you. So what, what's going on here with this story? It seems kind of strange to us, but there's a lot that we can take out of it. Uh, notice very clearly that there is no ultimate distinction between the virgins. They're all waiting for the bridegroom. They all have the right to wait for the bridegroom. Um, they're all participants in the bridegroom in that sense. The only thing that marks them as different is some have more oil than others. They all fall asleep. Uh, in parallel passages, like in Romans 13, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, you know, Christians are told not to sleep. And so uh, we shouldn't take from this that sleep is a great thing. What's going on here is that the sleeping shows that Jesus' concern in this parable is not their early works. It's not about the beginning. It's about the end. The emphasis is on the end. The cry goes out at midnight. The bridegroom is here coming. And they all trim their lamps. They're all ready uh, to go, except that the foolish realize they don't have enough oil. Uh, the wise are not chastised because they don't have enough oil to give them. That, that's not the point of the story. The story is just going on. And so the foolish have to go and buy more oil. And we might think, well, how are they going to do that? Well, markets then as now are always going to be open if there is a need. And so there will be somebody to sell oil if you need some in the middle of the night. And so they go and get it. And the narrative presumes they go and get more oil. And they come back. And they're, they're ready. But as they've gone to get the oil, the bridegroom has come. And the wise virgins have entered into the marriage feast. The other ones come back, they knock on the door, and they're banned. They do not have access to the teacher. Uh, he does not know them. Very reminiscent of Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 and 23. So, what do we do with some of the details in the story? You know, what do the virgins represent? What does the oil represent? What do the five and five and ten represent? And uh, people will give you answers. There are all kinds of speculations out there about what these all might represent. But we need to really resist the temptation to assume that they have to represent something. Uh, sometimes we like to think, well, parables, each part has to have its own meaning. Well, sometimes parables do that, where you, know, you can look at identifiable details, you know, and this, the, the different kinds of uh, soils in the parable of the sower, uh, the pearl of great price. But sometimes, the parable is in the action of the story, where you're just given characters because the characters are, are narrating the events. It's the events themselves and how the events play out that really the focus here. So the number of virgins is maybe just conventional for, for a marriage. We, we shouldn't necessarily read anything into that. The fact that there's oil, that's just what you need. That's just the, 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 the supply that defines the situation here. And, and really the core of the story is you've got five virgins that have made sufficient preparation and they could enter the feast when the bridegroom arrived. Uh, but uh, five did not, and they could not enter. And there's so much that we can take from this. Because what's going on here specifically in the parable of the ten virgins, that sets it apart from all this other stuff, is the Lord is talking about the power of preparedness for the delay. 
Uh, Matthew 24, we already saw emphasis on preparedness. You don't know when he's going to come. You need to be active and busy in the kingdom. In Parable of Talents, in Matthew 25, 14 through 30, you'll see another emphasis on the, the fact that you need to be working so that when the reconciliation happens at the end, you have something to show for, for the uh, gifts the Lord has given you. But here, the emphasis on you need to be ready. You need to be ready. That's even what we see in verse uh, 13. Watch, you do not know the day or the hour. You need to watch, you need to be ready. But even there's other passages. We can look at Romans 13, 1 Thessalonians 5, 2 Peter 3, talking about watching and being ready. And those show us that this is a major theme when it comes to that eschatological expectation, right? But what does it look like to be ready? Well, to be ready, you need to be first in a restored relationship with God. You need to turn away from your sins. You need to put your trust that Jesus is Lord. You need to repent of your sins, confess his name, be immersed in water in the name of Jesus for forgiveness of your sins, all that initial stuff. And so many people put that off, thinking, well, I've got time. Um, I'll do that at a more convenient season in life. Uh, I've got this and this I need to deal with first. And that's such a foolish thing to do, because we, we don't know when it's going to happen. We know it will happen, but we don't know when it's going to happen. So we need to be very careful about uh, that kind of logic. And so many people are uh, going to be condemned because they follow that line of logic. And today we encourage anybody who's putting off uh, serving the Lord to realize that you do not know when it's going to happen. And that so much of what the Lord has, in, has expressed to us uh, is fundamentally based on the idea that you have begun a relationship with Him. And you need to restore that relationship and be striving toward relational unity with God in Christ. And that's a very important thing about preparation, is you need to actually do all that initial stuff. But in this parable, that's all presumed. Because the virgins are all already in the kingdom. They're already waiting for the bridegroom. They're already there. And all of them have done basic preparations. You know, uh, Preparation is very important. Uh, I do a lot of work with the Boy Scouts of America, and our motto is be prepared. In other words, be prepared for a reason. Because if you are only going to wait for when a problem comes up to deal with the problem, uh, you're not going to be able to deal with that problem. And making sure that you have all the resources you need, that you've done the proper planning, you know what's going to happen with the weather, you have uh, your first aid kit, you've got enough water, you've got enough food, maybe even a little extra water and food. You know where you're going, you know who to contact if there's a problem. All of those preparations uh, are fundamental and it's the difference between life and death or a crisis versus a disaster if there is something that happens and so preparation is very important and in the Christian faith we must always be ready and that initial surge after we become a Christian you know we got all the zeal all this energy all of this interest and we're normally actually pretty well suited for that initial burst of faith and we're really looking forward to the Lord's return but what's so powerful about this parable and unique about this parable is that the wise and foolish virgins are all ready for the bridegroom to come soon. If the bridegroom had come before midnight, they would all be able to enter into the eschatological banquet. It is because uh, there is a delay that we have this parable. And so it's in the delay that we really have the message of the parable of the ten virgins. And it's interesting because so many scholars want to look at uh, early Christianity and just assume, well, they all assumed that Jews would come back really soon. And yet throughout the text, there's all these indications there's going to be a delay. We see it right here. In the parable of the talents, the whole premise is that the delay exists so that people can work, so that they will be able to give a return on the uh, investment, so to speak, of the Lord. In Revelation 20, there's a millennium for a reason. Uh, that whole picture exists to show there's going to be this long time of indeterminate length where the Lord will not yet fully return. And it's a very interesting difference, isn't it? Uh, the challenges that can come for Christians over time that may not be there at the very beginning, but happen as they uh, endure in faith or strive to endure in faith. And actually, we see a few situations like this in Scripture. Um, we can think about the Galatians. Uh, the Galatian letter is written because whether after a few months, years, maybe uh, many, many years, depending on your view of when Galatians was written, the uh, Galatian Christians hear this message from the Judaizers that they should, you know, begin circumcision and following the law of Moses. And very quickly they're persuaded by it. And Paul has to write to them about their abandoning the faith because of this. 
uh, the Hebrews author. The only thing we really know about the audience that the Hebrews writer is writing to is that they have been Christians for some time. They've gone through persecutions. They've lost property. They've been shamed in, in chapter 10. But they are growing weary. They are in danger of uh, falling away. The pressures of society, the shame that they're enduring in society uh, is just getting to them. And, and they are flagging in their faith. And so the Hebrew author writes to encourage them to persevere. In Ephesian, the Ephesian church, in, in Revelation 2, uh, Jesus' message to it is that, they, hey, they have held firm to the truth. They have seen false apostles, identified them, and uh, did not receive them. But Jesus says this against them. They have left their first love. And if they don't repent and restore themselves to the love they had at first, he will remove their candlestick, remove them from his presence, something not said to the other churches. And so you've got these dangers that attend to life in the faith over time, where at first you've got the surge of interest and energy, but as time goes on, you grow weary. You are constantly fighting. You maybe are in despair because of the world's pressure, because of disappointment from brethren, from all these different places. Uh, you may subtly start saying, well, I've done a lot. The Lord is good with me. You take your election for granted. You take your standing for granted. And you just start in, in a thousand different ways giving up. And that's the danger. That's the not having enough provision. That's the up the bridegroom is here and you look and you're, you're out of oil. You're out of gas. And you need to get more in order to be ready for the return of the Lord. And that's the big danger here. Uh, and that's what Jesus is really emphasizing here. He knows there's going to be delay, and he knows that it's going to be difficult. That's why when we see in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27, that run the race so you might win, we can't think of that as a 100-meter dash. We need to look at it as a marathon. And those have very different philosophies involved. You can't run a 100-meter dash like you'd run a marathon. You'd lose. You can't run a marathon like it's a 100-meter dash. You're going to run out of energy very, very quickly. And that uh, is exactly what the Lord is concerned about. People who start well, uh, but are not able to finish the race. And that's the issue that's really in mind here in the parable of the ten virgins. And that's what we need to emphasize in our understanding of it. And the Hebrews author does such a beautiful job of talking about what's really important. That in Hebrews chapter 10, he talks about how we need to maintain our trust in God, to hold fast to our confession without wavering, uh, because he who promised is faithful. And that we need to consider one another, to stir up one another, love and good works, to not neglect meeting with one another, but encouraging one another and all the more as that day draws near. That we don't flag in our faith, we don't flag in our confession, we don't flag in our consideration of one another, that we're constantly reinforcing one another, constantly strengthening one another to keep our eyes on the goal. Because the fact of the matter is, we don't know when it's going to happen. That's what he makes very clear in verse 13. It's what he's already said a couple times in chapter 24. You think if any message were clear at this point, it is we will not know when the Lord is going to return. Yet, that has not stopped people for 2,000 years in their speculation about when the Lord's going to return. Uh, so many people had devoted so much energy trying to figure out all the various ways to put things together and to find the secret knowledge. Ah, if I just look at this passage with this passage, if I figure out the code here, I will know and I will be able to tell. It's led to dispensational premillennialism. It's led to a flurry of denominations and all kinds of false doctrines and false teachings like that. Uh, the news we constantly hear of some guy saying, ah, the Lord is going to come back in 2000 and 2012, on this date, on that date. And of course, it's 2020, and we're still here. It's because of foolishness. It's because of this Gnostic goal. Uh, it's not from Jesus, it's from Gnosticism. Ah, secret knowledge. This will mean I know. I have gained access to it. And all of it is an attempt to get away from the uncertainty of life. But Jesus calls us to dwell on the uncertainty, to trust. And see, when you hear that the Lord's going to return, there's different ways that you deal with that. You can deal with the uncertainty by saying, well, he hasn't come yet. I'm not going to worry about it. And that is dangerous in so many of the parables. The, the wicked servant, that's his assumption. Another danger is the Lord's coming. I need to know when. And so you try to sort it out and you come up with some answer, but it's a delusion. Another way of saying is just to live in the constant apprehension and anxiety. The Lord could return at any time. The Lord could return at any time and freak out. None of those are what's expected. None of those are going to honor Jesus. And so what Jesus says is, you don't know. And in fact, there's one certainty out there. 
Okay, two certain news. One certain news is the Lord's going to return. It's not going to be on any of these dates that people are, are speculating because we don't know the day of the hour. But the other certainty is that God takes a lot longer to accomplish his purposes than any of us would care for. That's what you see throughout the Old Testament. It takes hundreds of years. In Psalm 88 and 89, they're wondering that. And Psalm 90 is the answer. That uh, the Lord does what he's going to do in his good time. And his time frame is much different than ours. Uh, we only live 70, 80 years, maybe 100 if we're lucky. Uh, to him, that's one day. It's not that long. So he, he takes a lot longer in all that he's doing. Um, I'm sure early Christians expecting Jesus to be vindicated over Jerusalem were looking for it a lot earlier than 40 years. I'm sure Christians looking for justice against Rome uh, really want to see it before an extended period from 150 to 600. And certainly we would expect the Lord to have returned before 2,000 years, and yet here we are. And we don't know. Maybe tomorrow. It may be the next day. It may be in another 1,000 years. Are we okay with that? Can we maintain our faith and trust, whether it's today, tomorrow, or in a thousand years? Because in the end, that's what is really Jesus is after. Putting our trust in God, not having to know the day, knowing that whether it's today or later, we can be fine and we can be well in Jesus. That we're not going to know the day or the hour. But we will be remiss if we did not spend some time looking here at the powerful hope that is being extended to us in this parable. What is it that everybody's waiting for? They're waiting for the wedding feast, the eschatological banquet. And it's such a powerful and beautiful thing that we're seeing it as an eschatological banquet. Weddings are fun. Weddings are beautiful. Weddings are when we celebrate a man and woman becoming one and a new life. It's, in fact, a lot of times the celebration of the woman. That's her time to shine. And in, in a time where normally you're full of drudgery and full of, you know, very basic foods, the seven-day wedding feast is a powerful, beautiful moment. <clears throat> and that's exactly why it's emphasized that the consummation of all things in Christ is seen as a marriage supper of the Lamb and that we're to try to attend the marriage supper of the Lamb. We have to remember that the most powerful and consistent metaphor throughout Scripture is God is the husband and his people are his wife. We see it in Hosea, we see it in Ezekiel, we see it in Jesus in, in many things he says, and of course Paul in Ephesians chapter 5 with the church. And God's whole purpose is relational unity, that we would become one with God and one another as God is one within himself. And marriage is a powerful demonstration of, mar of, of, of that unity, that the two uh, become one flesh, no longer two, but one, as Jesus says in Matthew 19, 4 through 6. And beyond all that, a wedding feast is a great party. It's a celebration. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. And so Christians are to look forward to that party. We are to look forward to seeing face to face and to enjoy the glory uh, that God is going to give us in that beautiful day of resurrection when we are in his presence forever, uh, as we see in Revelation 21 and 22. Uh, it's such a beautiful, beautiful thing. And yet we have a taste of that now, that we participate with God in his work, in the spirit, that we grow in relational unity with him now, that we become conformed to the image of the Son in Romans 8 and verse 29, that it's not something just entirely to be expected in the future, but that we have a down payment of it at the moment, and we get to share in it with one another as a fellow people of God. But all of this is just a dim view of the powerful glory of that supper. And the worst thing that could possibly happen to you is to not enter that supper and to spend all kinds of time devoted to the Lord Jesus, but then just not being ready at, at, at the last moment and knocking on that door and hearing that condemnation. I don't know you. Depart from me. I never knew you. Such a, such a horrible thing that will happen for so many people, and we don't want that for any of us. And that's why we need to commit to the Lord Jesus in faith, in confession, in repentance, in baptism, that we grow in our holiness and relational unity with him, to live always ready that the Lord would return, even after a long period of time, that we can enjoy the celebration inherent in dwelling in God's presence, that we're filled with his glory for all eternity in the resurrection of life, that we'll enter into the joy of our Master and to share in that beautiful feast. Let us again go to the Lord in prayer. Father, hallowed be your name. We're so thankful, Father, for this beautiful message you've given us, for the great hope that you've given us in Jesus, that we can share an eternal life with you, to share in your presence forever, that you will glorify us beyond our imagination, that we will know as we are known, that we will see face to face. 
And we're so thankful that you've extended this hope for us in Jesus. And so we pray, Father, that you would provide us the strength in your spirit that we might endure, that we might be ready to endure, that we may not just focus on the short term, but also the long term in our faith, that we would seek to glorify you, whether we uh, are here for only a short time or for a very long time, whether you, you will have Jesus return in a moment or in another thousand years that we may be found acceptable in your sight at all times, uh, no matter what, because we are oriented and directed toward you and growing in that relational unity and, and enduring whatever trials and knowing that we will endure any trial that we come across if we trust in you because you will strengthen and sustain us through it. That it won't necessarily look like anything we intended or, or would have expected, but that in the end you will be glorified and honored if we have maintained our trust in you. And that we have no control or power really in the circumstance beyond whether we're going to trust in you and to find strength in you or whether we're going to go in our own ways and suffer uh, devastation and destruction away from your presence for all eternity. And of course, Father, we pray earnestly that your son would return. Maranatha, that we may see the realization of justice and that we may share in the resurrection of life for eternity. And we pray all these things in, in your son's name. Amen. We're again thankful that you've joined us. If we can be of any service, please reach out to us. And may uh, the Lord guide, direct, and bless you until we're able to meet again.